that's the, basically the way you're going to hold it. I like to, it's good to either throw a little bit of cord in your lat like this so you have some excess, or I like to throw it over my shoulder and pull it down. The reason that I do that is then you're not pulling the weight of the cord as you're welding. You have this sitting over you and you're, it's only this much weight that's, that's actually being moved. When it's like this, um, you're gonna be, it's gonna be moving your arm around. All it takes is just a little bit of a weight of this to, uh, to dip you in and get you contaminated. So, like I said, I like to throw it over my shoulder and, um, and that's how I get set up. So, <clears throat> when you're welding, the, um, the torch angle is very important, how you're setting your hand up, how you get the torch set up. Um, so if we were welding straight on here, um, this is probably a little bit too much stick out. We're just doing this flat, flat piece. So what we want to do is you loosen your back cap here. And uh, it's going to probably be hard to see with my gloves, but I pushed it in a little bit. So you want to push it in just a little bit. Now my, the tip of it isn't quite on it, but you want it to be really close like that. So this is something you need to be pretty, um, pretty precise when you're TIG welding. So you want straight on like this. Um, it's going to put heat directly into the panel like that, but you're not going to be able to add your filler rod. So when your time comes to, to actually dip some filler rod, you can't even really get in there. So you need to turn it back just a couple degrees. You can add your filler rod like that. Um, when you turn it too much like this, your arc's gonna come out and just be shooting across and it's gonna be putting heat all the way out into here. And you're gonna be, if it's anything um, that's, that's uh, thinner gauge, it's gonna just start warping the heck out of the panel. So you wanna try and keep it just a couple degrees off of, um, off like this. You, know, you can even go like that, depending on your, what you prefer. Now you can hold your hand above. Another big thing is getting, um, it's getting comfortable. I myself, I'm kind of shaky by nature, so I really have to balance my hand on the edge of the table, um, or I have to kind of drag the cup like this, because for whatever reason, I'm just a shaky, my hands are shaky, a lot of people have that problem. That's the thing you can do. If you set your workpiece up so it's like this, and your hands on the table, it's going to help you steady quite a bit more as you're welding. So you're going to be moving across like that. You're going to be moving across like that. It helps you steady it. Or depending on the joint, um, this, I'll show you on this one. Uh, so on a joint like this, which we're going to show you in a few minutes, you can rest it like this. And you can drag it across. Helps with, you, with any, any of you guys or gals that have shaky hands. That's a good way to do it, um, just to lean it on the panel. So now that I got that set up, um, I'll show you before we strike the arc, just with uh, how you want to hold your hands for adding the filler rod. Now, a good thing to practice is feeding filler rod with your hand. This is basically what you're going to be doing. So people do it differently. I like to use the, my first two fingers here and pinch it, and then between my thumb. And then um, I can just feed it like that. So a good thing when you're first learning how to TIG weld is just when you're sitting there drinking a beer, doing whatever, do this. Just practice. It's like, you know, practicing with a basketball or something where you're just dribbling. Same type of thing. Just practice. Just keep moving the rod back and forth so you can get used to adding filler rod because that's something that you need to learn how to do because as you're melting it away, this is getting shorter and shorter, and suddenly next thing you know, your hands are like this and your hands in the arc. So you need to be able to get to the point where you can keep that filler rod and just keep adding, 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 adding as you're going. Um, depending on what you're doing, again, I went back to the preference. If you're somebody that likes the thinner filler rod, you may have to be really good at just feeding wire, moving it real quick because you have to add it so fast. Um, so that's something you definitely want to practice at home um, is getting just a good feed hand when you're feeding the filler wire. So that's the um, basics of setting up your hands. So I'm going to turn the machine on here. Got our gas on. And um, as I mentioned, you want to make sure your pedal is, uh, is set. So we're welding some thicker steel here. So I have it set with this quarter inch 
I'd set it around 140 on, on our pedal. Now, different pedals, you're gonna set it different ways. Ours basically has kind of a sweep that it'll hit 140, but if I wide open throttle it, I can get it down up to 200 amps if I want. So I have it at 140, so it's probably like 70% throttle, 80% throttle, I'm on, I'm on this. It's just like a gas pedal, so the more you push down, the more you're gonna get. So I'm gonna hit the trigger so you can hear the gas coming out of this. Um, you can hear the post flow I was talking about. A good thing to do the first time you're welding of, for the day, the first time you turn the machine on, before you strike an arc is just hit this pedal one time to get some gas flow. You get everything purged out of here in case there's anything contaminants that are in the line in your nozzle, that's gonna purge them out. So I um, think I should do it close to that. All right, so I'll hit this and hopefully you can hear it. So that's the gas that you could hear coming out. Now if I turn this up, I'd say to five seconds. Much longer. So that's basically all your post flow is doing. Your, uh, your pre-flow, you're not gonna really be able to hear that. It's such a small, short period of time. It happens so quick that you're probably not gonna notice it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically what you wanna do and that's the post flow that you can hear. So let me put my pedal back underneath. We'll get set up here. So like I said, I'm gonna run. What's gonna happen um, is he's gonna flip the, uh, we have a welding lens that we basically put on the, um, let's see here. So that we put on the, on the end of the uh, camera so you can actually see while we're welding. This is gonna go dark, um, just so you know, for a couple seconds before I actually, um, before I actually do any welding. So, I, like I said, I'm going to start an arc here, and uh, just let me know when you're when you're good. All right, so I'm going to start the arc here and let you guys see what's happening. So, hopefully, you can see it's starting to get a little like a wet puddle there. Once you see that that puddle, that's when you move. You move, 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 move. So each time you move, that's when you want to be uh, adding filler rod. So you just want to practice that as you're, um, you're first learning. Run a couple passes like that without adding filler rod just so you can get yourself comfortable. So now I'm going to just add a little bit into this, um, into this joint here and let you see the process. I'm gonna draw, go kinda slow so you guys can really see what's going on here. So you see I'm melting both the metal. Once you see them start to melt, you can add your filler rod. Move, add filler rod, move. I'm going real slow here. And as you can see, I'm adding it right to the front of the puddle. You don't want to add it to the back because that's when you might contaminate it. So you want to just add it right to the front of that puddle. Oop. And you let off the throttle real slow. And then you keep your hand there. So you keep your hand over the weld at the very end, like I showed there, until your gas stops flowing. So hopefully you could see as I was going real slow there, the, the dipping as, um, as we went around. And you want to fill, so this joint here, I beveled the joint since we we're doing a thicker piece of steel. I beveled the joint so that you could, you could get your weld to fill down in. Now this could be for both visual and for strength, so you can get a penetration down further in. Um, and also for visual, so if you're doing something with automotive where you're trying, you know, with a street rod or something where you're trying to make it um, smooth, it's almost smooth with the metal there. So we're not gonna be grinding much of our weld away. So that's why I beveled that joint like that. There's multiple reasons that you would do that. But, you know, if you're trying to build a show vehicle where you want everything to be nice and flat or you wanna smooth off your welds, Beveling the joint is going to make a world of difference so you can really 
lay your filler rod right in there and kind of um, fuses the two areas together. So if this is something, I'd probably do another pass on, you know, on the back or something like that. If this was quarter inch, something structural, you may need to do multiple passes um, to get it, you know, melted in how you want. So now that we did that, I'm going to show you, I'm going to just readjust to the other side of the table. And I got a lap joint and a T joint set up here. Um, and I'll show you kind of how you can set your hand um, and readjust your electrode so that you can, um, so you can weld those. So just give me a second or two. We'll uh, move everything over here. And uh, we just have to move because it was for you guys to be able to see the, um, the weld joints really well, um, to actually see my hands to see what's happening. You, uh, you got to move this stuff around so he can kind of shoot at a better angle. Um, now another thing to mention, um, let me flip this around here. This is how the, uh, the filler rod comes in a real long piece like this. This is good if you're doing real long runs where you're going to use this all up in one shot. Most people, um, let's say beginners to intermediates even, you're not going to be able to, to feed this long. A lot of people can't do that. They may have to stop or that's something pretty long that you're welding. Um, what I like to do if I know I'm doing a shorter run is I cut them in the little sections, cut it in half like this. It's a little easier to handle. You don't have the filler rod flopping over your shoulder as you're, as you're feeding it. But if you're doing a real ro long run, you may need to leave a piece that's that long. So, pedal here. And uh, we'll do, let's see. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to weld this one right along here. And then we're going to stay dark again. And uh, I'm going to readjust and then move over to the left here and do this one. So because of, and before we flip that down there, I'm going to show you guys just the, um, so you guys remember we were welding, let's move over a little bit. Um, you guys may have remembered me talking about adjusting the electrode. So when you look in here, when we were welding that butt joint, we were fine. But in here, we need to get all the way into that corner there. So let me point this here. We need to be directing our, our, our arc right into that, that corner there. So right now, we're a little too far away. What's going to happen is it's gonna, the arc's going to be bouncing around back and forth and wandering, trying to find you know, the, its home where it wants to be. So you need to, <clears throat> something like this, you need to loosen this up. I may need some, let's see here. There we go. So we're gonna, you're going to push it out a little bit. Let me, um, and you want to just test your, you know, test where it's at. So I pulled it out quite a bit there. That might be a tiny bit too close. So I'd go back here. I'll take this off so you can kind of see. So I'll come back and just push it in just a, a tiny bit. And then go back, you know, and test where you want it to be. So that's a pretty good spot there. It's really close. I may even go back in just a tiny bit. That's basically how you want it to be. You want it to be pretty darn close without touching. Um, so I'm going to go in just a, just a hair there. And then I'm going to just you know, tighten that back cap back up. And then we'll just test again to make sure we didn't move. And then we're pretty good. So you're going to want to do a test run like this anytime you're welding something. You know, do a run. Make sure that you can. You know, I'm doing pretty short pieces here, but if you're doing something that's longer, make sure you can do it comfortably. You're not getting too out of position. You're not getting, uh, you know, something's not blocking your vision, et cetera. So we can do this run here. I like to keep, like I said, I keep my hand on here, and I can drag like this. And I keep real light pressure on my hand on the table. It's just there for stability, so you don't, you're not anchoring your hand. You just want to leave it there real light and just slide back and forth. So now that we got that, I'll do a little, um, a little T-joint here and uh, let you guys see how, the, how you angle the arc where you want it to be.
and I'm going to actually have to pull that closer. There we go. All right. I'm going to actually be back. Normally, I like to weld. I like to keep my, I'm in pretty close like this. Um, just so you guys can see, I'm going to stand back a bit. So just uh, for the sake of letting you guys see everything, I'm going to move back a little bit. So let's do another weld here. All right, so I'm going to start our arc there. You can see I'm aiming it right in, the, right in the center there. When you start to see it melt together, you can move, dip, move, dip, move. You're adding it right into your joint. Sometimes what you can do is count. Do one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five 1,000. And count in your head to kind of keep yourself in a rhythm. That's how you see, oh, as I'm talking, I get off my rhythm there. But you can, that's how you can get those real perfect, evenly spaced. You can do a little, you know, counting in your head or tick. You can play some music that has a beat, you know, anything that, that helps. And then I back off real light and let off, keep that gas flowing, and then stop. And he's going to stay dark for you. And I'm going to do this lap joint here. I just got to readjust my um, my magnets. So, and here I'm probably a little close, so I'm going to. All right. So I'm going to drop down, and we'll do this lap joint here. See, we're melting that bottom metal. We're not melting the top edge. We're melting the, be the, the bottom edge to the bottom piece. That's where having this pinpoint um, grinding it to a point really helps because you're not melting that top area. You're not undercutting it. And dipping it right to the front of the puddle there. Back off the throttle, and then let go and let that gas flow. Now you can see, you know, a couple pretty good welds look like once he adjusts back in there. Um, now with that coloring that you're seeing there, that's um, basically when you have the right um, combination of, of speed and gas flow, you can get that color like that that you might you know, you, you see online. Um, you know, some of these real high-end fabricators, they're constantly doing that, showing that off. That's what that combination is. Just because you do not have that doesn't mean it's a bad weld. Um, if you have a weld that's, that's silver, um, you know, it looks consistent. Let's see if I have one here that I did. Like this one here that I did with the, um, that one doesn't necessarily have quite the coloring as the other one. That's still, you know, that weld's still penetrating um, pretty good. So don't get down on yourself. Now, if you see a, Yeah, just talking about the coloring. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. We had a little uh, something happen with our connection here. So what I was going back to, we just got done welding these two pieces here. You can see that coloring, the kind of rainbow, rainbow coloring, kind of like Smurfs blood. Um, that's basically when you have your, your speed and your gas flow and your heat just right, you can get those, that coloring. Um, that's what you're going to see online, all these guys that are, you know, the real high-end professional TIG welders. They're going to be posting photos like this, uh, you know, everybody wants to do. 
just because you do not get that coloring as you're learning does not necessarily mean it's a bad weld. You want to focus on getting your timing right, your penetration right, um, more so than trying to get fancy rainbow colors. This piece I have here doesn't have quite the coloring, but still has, you know, it's a pretty good weld. So really you want to just make sure your weld looks good. It's, it's not, it doesn't have any contaminants in it. So I have another piece here that I'll show you guys that I purposely contaminated. So you can see that little dot in the center there. That's where I, where I stuck my electrode into the puddle when it was still molten. I dipped it in and it actually got stuck in there and I had to break it off. You're going to probably have to grind that out if you want to be, you know, if you want to be picky about it, you really should grind that out and re-weld that section. Um, this one here is where I dipped it in, the filler rod and the, uh, the filler rod and the electrode together. I dipped them and I created that blob there. And then if you see all this black soot and junk around it, that's all the contaminants that's coming out. So this was a piece that I, I hit it with a flap disc pretty good, but I didn't wire brush it or anything or wipe it down before I started welding. Um, and there were some contaminants that pulled out of the back of that. So when you see that black soot, um, black or brown soot around there, that means it's dirty. You want to probably start cleaning that piece again. So if you start seeing that, where it starts spitting on you or popping, just stop and try and diagnose and see what's causing that. If you see this you know, soot around it, Take a wire brush and try to clean it out. So take your wire brush. Another thing that's, that I like to mention, I forgot to mention earlier, is I like to label my brushes. Keep your steel and your aluminum brushes separate because as you're, you're sanding or you're wire brushing, you're getting little particles of metal in there. So if you're welding aluminum and you have steel particles in your brush, go to clean your aluminum piece. You now just put dirty pieces of steel right into your aluminum, which is going to um, you know, not be good. So you'd want to go through this piece. Wire brush it out pretty good. Try and get in the corners. May want to wipe, you know, I may try and get some acetone in there to clean it out. And it could be coming from this other side where we did a, a little practice run. Could just be it was baking it out, you know, through the other side. So you may want to clean this as well. And just go over, get clean metal, and then you want to start over. So that's what it's going to look like. Again, if you get a contamination, you got to stop. You got to stop and re-weld it. Uh, I'm sorry, stop and re-grind your electrodes. So now we showed you guys that. Uh, we had a handful of questions. We mentioned we were doing this uh, class about thin gauge stuff, about TIG welding um, sheet metal, which is something that is pretty cool. It's really good. It has its place. Um, and yeah, so we're going to show you how to set up a butt joint for uh, thin gauge steel. I just got to switch my plug here. And we're going to show you on the TIG 200 DC. That's a unit that we have that only does steel. Now it has the same power, same output as that TIG 200 AC DC. But it comes in a little oversized lunchbox uh, um, package. That's because it's DC only. So the electronics are much, uh, aren't as large that's required. Um, I like to use the TIG 200 DC for doing my sheet metal fabrication. I like to keep that one separate with one of these torches. This is our um, number nine, WP number nine, uh, mini torch as we call it. So I have a, let's see here, I'll show you the, the difference real quick. So see what the, what the difference of them in the actual size of the head, it's a lot, it's a lot more stubby. And I have a little gas lens on this one as well. So these are really good. This is only good for low amperage. I think um, it's rated to like 100 or 110 amps, if I remember correctly. Um, so you don't want to be trying to do thick stuff with that. The, um, the parts that come with it, I'll just show you that real quick, are real small as well. So you need to have, you need to have the collet and collet bodies in the different cups to match. And these cup size, it's just depending on what you're welding, the joint that you're trying to weld in, what you're going to need. The gas lens, again, I prefer that. It gets better coverage um, and helps um, 
keep that area you're welding in in a little vacuum, so to speak, so it's not getting the gunk in the air isn't getting on it. So when you're welding sheet metal, you definitely, definitely want a sharp pinpoint needle point on the end of your electrode. You want your, your, um, your weld puddle to be as small and tight as possible. So you need to grind this to a real sharp point. Okay, so we're going to finish this uh, little weld here, and then we're going to take some questions from you and wrap it up. Appreciate everybody uh, sticking around for this. There's a lot to cover. Um, so I have a piece of sheet metal here. I'll flip it over. Um, what you want is a real tight gap like that. With welding sheet metal, you want it as tight of a gap as possible. So you want to, if you're trying to put a, a quarter panel or a, a patch panel on a door or whatever, you want it to be as tight as possible. You want a file to fit those panels so that they fit extremely tight in there uh, without being an interference fit. You want it to be a nice tight fit uh, with sheet metal because you don't get much of a second chance if it's, if you got a little gap or an opening, it's just going to blow open and it's going to cause a mess. So I suggest, uh, you know, making sure your patch panels fit really well. So I'm going to do a little weld here. Like I said, I'm using just 030 filler uh, MIG wire, ran off a spool and straightened out. And I'm going to do a couple of little small um, welds. And you're not going to run long welds on sheet metal. It's the same as with MIG welding, where you want to do a couple little short passes and then jump around the panel. Same thing. So this one's going to be a little tougher for you guys to see because it is, uh, it is so small. The puddle is so small. All right, so. And if you saw that little gunk that came out, I forgot to uh, pre-purge that line, and that's what that was. So a little tiny puddle, we're just welding. And then I'm going to do another one. I'm going to move over here. So you do that, and then you move to your next one. And if you're pretty good, you can actually fuse these panels together without really any filler wire if you have a tight enough butt joint. Got a little off course there because I was trying to, trying to keep my head back on that. But the, uh, the TIG 200 DC has a preset post flow, so you can't adjust that, but it's not a bad thing. Um, so those are your little tiny baby welds. Like I said, I got a little off course there because I was trying to keep my head back so the camera could see. Um, but that's what you're going to want to do. Little one inch, two inch, little um, passes, maybe three inches tops. And then you want to jump around the panel. Um, the key thing that you're going to do when you're TIG welding, um, it's again, kind of like oxyacetylene, is you're going to want to hammer your, your weld. So you can see here, it's already started to lift up from that, from the heat. It's pulling. So what you would want to do if this was a panel, is you're going to put your, uh, your dolly on one side and hammer right on the weld immediate, immediately afterward. I like to try and do it. That's going to flatten your weld out, and it's going to release the panel. So you're going to, you're going to stretch it back out from the heat. So that's basically uh, the, the gist of everything I wanted to cover today. Um, if anyone has any type of um, questions, we can take them now. Um, I do want to mention if any, any, any of you guys or gals are interested in a like personalized class where we can go in depth a little more on anything specific, um, please hit us up on any of social media, hit us up on YouTube, um, or just email us through the website directly. Let us know because we'd like to do some, uh, you know, some smaller classes where we can really help you hone your skills. Um, but this is just to get you guys kind of jump started. So uh, do we have any questions? Uh, the question was, on steel, is there an advantage to TIG versus MIG welding? Um, there's a couple ways you can answer that. Um, with MIG, the, the benefits are it's going to be, most times, it's going to be faster. 
Um, it's also more forgiving, so you don't have to have the metal quite as clean where you can weld. You still need to clean it, but it's a little more forgiving. Um, the control is much more difficult with MIG. I mean, you could control pretty good, but you guys saw with this puddle how I can really manipulate the puddle. You can't do that quite the same with a MIG weld. Um, the one benefit um, that I like to, when it comes to sheet metal, sheet metal with steel um, is definitely easier with MIG. Um, so the learning curve's a lot um, less sharp. Um, but with TIG welding, the welds are actually softer. Um, you can hammer weld a TIG weld much like you could an old oxyacetylene weld, a gas weld. You can hammer it, it's, it's, um, it's still soft. So you can hammer it, you can form it, you can grind it, shape it in, where a MIG, MIG weld is much more hard and brittle. So you can grind it, but it's not gonna be the same where you can hammer weld it like you can um, a TIG weld. So they really have their place. Uh, MIG weld as well, it's easier to get in tight areas, so there's a lot of times where I'll use a MIG welder to get in an area that I can't get with a TIG just to spot weld or, or um, you know, weld something up that's in a tight area that you just can't get to. So they both have their places, but I like TIG welding um, for the cleanliness. There's no sparks, there's no splatter, um, but it can be frustrating sometimes when you're doing you know, tight areas or real thin material, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So that's the, my best answer for that. Uh, the question was, is it okay for the cup, um, the gas cup, to touch the metal? Uh, the answer is yes. It's pretty much, it's fine. Like I was showing earlier, I drag my cup sometimes when I'm welding things. Um, let's see here, if we can see that. So I drag the, the, the far edge of the cup there when I'm welding. Um, these cups are made out of a material that's, uh, you know, the different cups that are out there, there's Pyrex, there's the lava, there's different types that are made. They're made for a really high temperature, high heat, so they're okay to lay on the, um, to lay on the, the piece as you're dragging, or, or, I'm sorry, as you're dragging it along. Um, sometimes when you're welding, there's a need for that, actually. There's, uh, I didn't cover it, but there's walking the cup, um, which is something that's more an industrial, but guys will do that, where you're actually rocking the cup right on the metal. That's part of the process. So it's completely okay, especially if you're just learning. It's not a bad thing. It's going to help you be more stable. Um, it's going to help you, especially in those T-joints, you can kind of butt it right up in there and slide across. So that's completely fine to do. Is there less heat in TIG on sheet metal? Uh, the question is, is there less heat um, when using a TIG on sheet metal? Um, if set up correctly, Yes, um, with, a, with a TIG welder, I can turn the amperage down really, really low, and I can get it just to the point where the metal is just hot enough to melt together, and I can add that filler rod just as much as I need. A MIG welder, it's much more difficult to get the, um, you know, you're trying to melt the metal, the base material, and your filler wire all at the same time. That creates a lot of heat to melt both materials together. So that creates a lot more heat. Um, but with a MIG welder, you can do one spot weld and then get off. Um, but with the, with the TIG welding, I can touch a, a TIG weld right next to it. You know, we were just welding these. I can already touch these real quick. With a, with a steel, if you, did three or, if you did three or four spot welds in this area that close, it, it would probably be heat. It would be heated out much further. So if you can get your TIG welder set up correctly, you can keep the, the temperatures down a little bit further, uh, a little easier. And like I said, you can control it with that foot pedal. You can get it just hot enough to melt the metal um, and add the, the filler rod. So I, I think there is, but it takes a lot of, a bit of skill, practice to get to that point. Um, so yeah, that's my best answer for that one. Oh, the ground clamp, that's a good, uh, somebody said, where's the ground clamp? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I, forgot to kind of cover that part of um, your ground clamp. This is what completes the circuit. So your ground clamp, when you put that on, that's what completes the circuit to your torch. I have, we have a big welding table here. That, this is a table that we have over in the shop that I like to use. The top's completely metal. So you can clamp this anywhere you want. So you can clamp it on the table, and as long as your workpiece is bare metal and it's touching the metal, it's gonna transfer the table and go right to your workpiece. Um, if possible, it's best to have the clamp as close as possible to the part. It's not completely a problem, but it's good to have it you know, as close as possible. You definitely want to make sure the table is not wet, you're not sweating, 
or you know, the part itself isn't anything like that because if you clamp it to this table, your hands sweaty, another reason why you should wear gloves, your arms sweaty, you might be the, soon your hand or your arm might be the closest spot to the ground and boom, you're the ground, you're gonna get zapped. So you wanna, you wanna try and get the ground clamp as, good, as close as possible, but if you have a good welding table, you can clamp it to the corner and you can just weld anywhere you want on the table. So good question, sorry I missed that one. All right, so that's all the questions that we have so far um, for, the, for this demo. I appreciate everybody that's watched. Um, again, if you have any questions at all um, or you wanna see any other live streams that Kevin's gonna do, myself or anyone else, um, hit us up, let us know. We wanna teach you guys, we wanna help. So thanks for watching and um, we'll catch you later, thanks.